All right, everybody, here we go. May shut out the lights on this one. We last left Europe a long time ago. We got the end of the Middle Ages. And we know at the end of the Middle Ages, we get a couple things happening. Number one, we have these, as a result of the Crusades, there's a massive new movement towards urbanization. The Crusaders come back. They've got knowledge and information in different products that encourages a lot of peasants to take the risk going down into the Holy Land into the Middle East and come back with products that they can sell. Kings begin to charter towns and townships, and we get a new urbanized population going on in Western Europe. Plus, we get the idea of crop rotation with the three-field system, and we get a larger, bigger population. Technology is invented. So by the end of the High Middle Ages, Europe is ready for something new. Right? We get this commercial revolution. Businesses begin to expand meeting with the Islamic merchants and learning about the ideas of paying with a check, of having an organized banking system. The European banking industry, I will loan you money now to go hopefully buy products and sell them, and you're going to pay me back, plus a little bit more. Merchants, credit, banking will transform Western Europe. And as a result, of the Islamic scholars and the Hebrew scholars, the Byzantine scholars, keeping Greco-Roman learning alive, Europe is able to regain the lost artifacts of the old liberal arts curriculum sponsored by Greece and Rome. Frederick Barbarossa helps to found the first European University in Bologna in 1158, modeled after the Islamic um, Madrasa. And pretty soon, different people like Dante Legri will begin writing in vernacular or the common language of the people. Not everybody will have to write in Latin. And this gives birth to the Renaissance or to the rebirth, most commonly headquartered here in the beautiful city of Florence, Italy, along the Arno River, and you got the Duomo right smack there in the middle. And Florence will be one of these Italian city-state empires that is going to revolutionize the world. For the first time in you know, hundreds of years, nearly six, eight hundred years, there's a rebirth in learning and in the arts. And British Prime Minister Winston Churchill said when they talked about getting rid of the arts, he said, well, if we get rid of art and music, then what are people going to read and write about? And so he's exactly right. It's going to start here in Florence and then spread to all parts of Europe. People begin to rediscover the classical and the ancient world. What did they have before us? And it happens here in Italy. And Italy is made up of several different city-states. The Kingdom of Naples, you got the Papal States, the Republic of Rome, the Republic of Genoa, um, Sardinia, Corsica, all these different little kingdoms that were run by merchants, the Venetian um, and the Italian trading cities like Marco Polo. No longer is a noble, all right? Old world, land-rich nobles are secondary to these new rich merchants who begin to become the bourgeoisie or the new town councils. They're the governments in these towns. Money was power. They begin to run and dominate politics. It's not a noble. It is a merchant. And no family is more famous than this than the famous Medicis of ancient Florence. Now, Florence claims to be an old republic, right, where we uh, democratically, democratically elect our leaders. In truth, Florence was under a dictatorship. The rich banking family of the Medicis runs the show. And Lorenzo Medici and his brother begin to dominate. 
And what makes the Medici's famous is they were so wealthy, they were bankers and confidants of the Pope, that they want to beautify their city. And it gets them into a lot of trouble early on as they begin to fund art projects. They are patrons of the arts. They will hire sculptors and artists to make their city more beautiful. And a lot of these Renaissance artists, kind of like the Ninja Turtles, um, are going to look to the ancient world, to Greece and to Rome, for their inspiration. And they're going to come up with the idea of perspective. We'll talk about it a few times. Where you have a flat painting here, but you draw objects in the background as smaller, and objects in the foreground as bigger, and it gives the illusion of depth in a painting. And here is the School of Athens. And what was great about the Renaissance artists, especially the Ninja Turtles, they like to paint themselves into the painting. So one is Socrates, the other is a student talking to Socrates. And all this is started by a smart guy named Francisco Petrarch. Francisco comes up with the idea of humanism. Let's focus on human potential and achievement. What can we accomplish ourselves? And Petrarch will work tirelessly to build a library that is full of every Greek, Greek and Roman book, copy, manuscript, leaflet, pamphlet he can lay his hands on. And he says, we need to go back and look at what these great civilizations and empires did. And let's look at Greek idealistic art, and let's look at Roman realistic art, and let's celebrate what humans can actually do. Instead of constantly focusing on religion, during the Dark Ages, the emphasis was on religious art, and, you know, the Black Death. Things were so bad that you look to heaven. He's like, ah, things are getting better. Let's focus on what's the, called the humanities. In the modern STEM education world, where everything is science and technology and math, that's great, but what about reading? What about writing? What about literature? What about music? What about art? What about history? So let's take a step back and look at that good old liberal arts curriculum that was founded back in ancient Athens. And one of the things the city of Florence is famous for in the Medici's is the world famous Duomo. It is a church of green and pink and white marble all quarried from in and around the city of Florence. And Filippo Brunelleschi will come up with a unique design to support the third largest dome on a church in Europe. It is actually three domes wrapped around each other, each one at a different angle, giving extra support for the great Roman arch system. So you go inside the Duomo and you see the bricks laid. Some are horizontal. Some are vertical. Some are at a 45 degree angle so the pressure points can support the massive weight of this dome. And the dome gets the Medici family in a lot of trouble, but Brutaleschi pulls it off. And he is noted as the first modern engineer. All right? And he's the guy who worked tirelessly supervising and planning out every phase of the cathedral of the Duomo. Before this, architecture was gothic, tall and very dark. Well, now we get something known as Baroque, and if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. And so the church will be built, the long part of it, where the parishioners sit, is built on a very long angle. The dome is the exact center of a smaller cross, so it looks like the cross. Again, we're religious in Italy, the crucifixion, and the dome sits right over the altar, and the windows are spaced to bring in light, and the light shines on the altar. The center of today is Ash Wednesday, the centerpiece of the Catholic Mass. And you face east where the sun comes up. Everything mathematically precise. The, the art, the sculpture, the way the purple or the pink and the green and the white flow together is absolutely beautiful. 
And so Florence will attract um, many artists, but the most famous are what we call the Ninja Turtle artists, Raphael, Donatello, 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 Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci. And Donatello here is noted for his bronze and marble sculptures. He is, you know, a sculptor more than anything. And he likes to use different religious characters in his artwork. But one of the things that he is going to help create um, is the Bronze David. And the Bronze David is an idea that comes up in several Renaissance artists. This one was commissioned by um, the Medici's, and it causes a big problem because David, the slayer of Goliath, is not only one naked, but he looks like a young boy with long hair. And he's wearing like this hat. And they said, why did you make that? You are making fun of a biblical character. It is obscene. It is rude. It is forbidden. And the Medici said, no. I patroned this work of art to be displayed in our great city, and it is the artist's interpretation. Who knows what David looks like? Well, you made him look like an effeminate young boy. And they said, well, who knows? He, he may have been. We don't know, but it was the artist's vision. Go with it. David was a young boy when he slew Goliath. He was not the warrior king that we know, so who cares what the guy looks like? And then Donatello also will create the painting of the knight St. George slaying the lion. And it begins to use perspective, the darkness of the cave where the dragon is coming out. The mountains and the ominous clouds. And the storm coming in behind the great biblical hero of St. George who slew the dragon or slew evil or slew temptation, saving the fair young maiden of innocence there. It's not as dark and, and kind of foreboding as other religious art. We're starting to get some texture, some brightness into it, and it's telling a story. Um, one of his most famous works is The Dinner of Herod, where John the Baptist um, was in prison, and the daughter of the queen said, if you want to give me a presence, I want here and now the head of John the Baptist on a plate. So here is a bronze sculpture on the party, and then in the end, John the Baptist's head will be brought in on a plate. So we still have those religious overtones, but everything is becoming more lifelike. Um, this is kind of like what a dinner party in Italy would be at the time, not back in ancient Israel. And so here we get the world-famous sculpture of the David, of Michelangelo. Michelangelo is my personal favorite Renaissance artist. He is known for his sculptures, for his paintings, and for his architecture. He does a little bit of everything. A deeply troubled guy, but just an incredible artist. And he is inspired by other Greek masterpieces, like the famous Greek Discobolus, or Poseidon, who is missing his trident, getting ready to throw it at the sea. In using them and his knowledge of the human body and artistic expression, Michelangelo creates the David. Whoops, wait a minute. That was the sculpture of me when I was posing as the David. Sorry about that. Here is the real David. Whoops, I am sorry. And the statue of the David is 26 feet tall. Um, and it is not the young Donatello David, but it is this guy. You can see his perspective um, here to this handsome young man. And here is the David, and if you look at the David, his head and his hands are a little different in proportion compared to the rest of the body. Because understanding religion, meaning humanism, Michelangelo said the thing that separates mankind is our ability to think, to form a plan, and then act on it. Human reason. So brain power meeting action. Form of a plan and follow through. This is one of the most famous works um, of sculpture in the world. And when asked 
how he made something so beautiful, Michelangelo said, well, the statue was always there. I just cleared away the pieces. If you've ever seen it, it's awesome. All right? He is most famous, besides the David, for painting the roof of the Sistine Chapel, building a scaffolding, laying about two or you know, three feet a foot, painting the fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel for the Pope. It's so famous if you ride the um, uh, world history ride, the golf ball at the Epcot Center, uh, Michelangelo is up there painting it. And the story, are different um, stories of the Bible and religion, and right smack dab in the middle, we have God creating man, getting ready to touch Adam and bring him life. And where they are, the separation between the two fingers is just about exactly one inch. Mathematically centered in the exact center of this building. There's another shot of it blown up. Just an incredible, incredible work of vibrant art. And when you go into the Sistine Chapel, um, this is what it looks like. It was the Pope's private chapel. And back on the ceiling, you have Michelangelo's vision going to heaven. And it's kind of dark in some ways. Right here, there is hanging skin, like a human being's skin. And Michelangelo said it was his, kind of modern artish, saying that when you die, you leave nothing behind but your skin and your bones. And going down in here, going into hell, were several people. And Michelangelo did not like the Pope and one of the bishops who made him do it. So very brazenly, he painted their likenesses as going down into hell where other people are going up into heaven. Kind of bold and brave. But they actually tracked Michelangelo down who ran away and forced him to make that painting. He's like, well, if you're going to make me do it, I'm going to do it the way I, I want to. And here is the Pieta in St. Peter's Basilica. And it's a good look at emotion, putting emotion in sculpture. Here is Mary holding the body of Jesus when he's taken down from the cross. And you can just see the sadness on a mother's face. And this is the only work right here on the cloak, on the inseam of Mary. It's the only work of art that Michelangelo ever signed. The 1970s, a crazy guy ran up with a hammer and smashed it. So when you go see it now, it is behind like thick bulletproof glass. I don't know what he was thinking. And so we're going to stop there today. We're going to pick up with Raphael and Leonardo and a lady named Sophonespa and Sangula tomorrow. All right, guys, I told you I'd make this one short. I'll see you on Friday writing an essay and taking some notes.